Hello and welcome to 8.3, which is photosynthesis. So if you thought 8.2, all about cell respiration was bad, uh, buckle up, buddies, because <laughs> photosynthesis is uh, unfortunately not much better. Um, there's a lot of similarities, so you're going to hopefully uh, have some familiarity with the terms that I am using, um, but it is quite the process of photosynthesis, so it is unfortunately not going to be um, an easier set of notes uh, than the last one. So let's dive right into uh, photosynthesis. So it is a two-step process, which is nice, right? Because cell resp is like a 3.5 step process. The link reaction is like kind of a half a step. But anyways, there are two steps in photosynthesis. Step one is light dependent, so it needs light to happen. And step two is light independent, where it does not need light to happen. All of this happens in the chloroplast of a plant cell. Uh, so let's quickly just break down step one, right? You absorb light by the chlorophyll, which is a pigment in the chloroplast. It releases electrons and it produces ATP, energy. Love that, love energy. The electrons are donated to carrier molecules, NAD+, plus, NADP+. Plus. And then the electrons lost from the chlorophyll fill are replaced by water, which is then split to produce oxygen and hydrogen. This happens in the thylakoids, which are just a structure within the chloroplast. We'll talk about that later. And then the light independent reactions um, happen in the stroma. Again, a section of the chloroplast. We'll talk about it a little later. So ATP and the hydrogen slash electrons are transferred to the stroma. They're combined with carbon dioxide and they form organic compounds. The ATP that you are producing provides the energy that is required to fix carbon molecules together, to put them together and have them stick together. So this is just sort of like a picture breakdown, right? Light dependent reactions, it all depends on having light energy available. And then um, that sort of gets broken down into water and then, or going into the chlorophyll and creating chemical energy. The water uh, creates hydrogen, right? It gets broken down into its oxygen and hydrogen. The hydrogen then uh, continues on with the products of your chemical energy to get put into the light independent reaction. And oxygen is uh, diffused out as a waste product. In the independent reaction, we have carbon dioxide diffusing in to be used with the uh, products of the light dependent reactions to go through carbon fixation to create organic compounds. So now we're going to break it down a little bit more. Um, we're going to start introducing some new terminology that's going to be um, used throughout. And so it's just sort of like important bits to um, understand now so that as I continuously say it over the next like six slides, you're not like, hang on, what is this woman talking about? So step one, the excitation of photosystems by light energy. So the key word here is photosystems, and they're just groups of photosynthetic pigments. For example, chlorophyll. There are more than just chlorophyll for photosystems, um, but we're going to talk about two big photosystems, um, and they're classified according to their absorption wavelengths. So we have photosystem one, in this case, photosystem one is sort of in the middle here, and their max absorb absorption wavelength is 700 nanometers. And then photosystem two max absorption is uh, 680 nanometers. So from here on out, I'm going to refer to photosystems one and two as PS1 and PS2. It, it's just easier. So when, they, when these photosystems absorb light energy, the electrons within those pigments become excited. When those electrons become excited, they're transferred to carrier molecules in the thylakoid membrane. This is very similar to when we were talking about it in cellular respiration. When those electrons get excited, they get picked up by those taxis. Well, guess what? That's happening here too. They're just different taxis. So, our next step is the production of ATP via, oh my gosh, look at this, another repeat, the electron transport chain. Yeah, that is coming back to haunt you. 
So the excited electrons from PS2 are transferred to an electron transport chain, an ETC, in the thylakoid membrane. As they go through that chain, they lose energy, which is used to translocate hydrogen ions into the thylakoid. This is exactly what happens in cellular respiration, right? Those electrons that go through the ETC, they become de-energized. It's the same thing. So as they lose energy, the buildup of protons creates a proton mode of force. Same thing you've already learned about. The hydrogen ions return to the stroma via ATP synthase, which is the same thing you've already learned about in cellular respiration, right? We have this rotation happening um, at the end of ATP synthase, and ATP is produced. So photophosphorylation occurs, which is just using the ATP synthase enzyme to catalase to catalyze ATP, and the de-energized electrons from PS2 are taken up by PS1. So you see this here, that PS2, which is on the left-hand side of this picture, has de-energized electrons, and they get sent over to PS1. Okay? We have the proton motor force. You see that as the hydrogen ions um, get pushed through this membrane. This is not wildly different from cellular respiration, but the pieces that we're talking about um, that are doing this process are different. So, right, we're using PS1, sorry, PS1 and PS2. Um, we didn't use those terms in cellular respiration, but the concept is the same. And then step three is the reduction of NADP plus and the photolysis of water. So those excited electrons from PS1 are transferred to a carrier molecule and used to reduce NADP plus into NADPH. Okay, S different carriers, but same concept. This NADPH is needed for the light independent reaction, which is like step two of this process. The electrons lost from PS1 are replaced by electrons from PS2. This is what we talked about last time, right? PS2 sends its electrons over to PS1. And the electrons lost from PS2 that were sent over to PS1 are replaced by water um, via photolysis, which is like the breakdown using light, right? You have light coming in, breaking down um, water into oxygen and hydrogen. And then those electrons are picked up by um, PS2. So all these things we've talked about, it's just sort of like, look at what happens. And remember, this doesn't happen like one step at a time. This is continuously happening like as the um, ATP synthase is rotating, you are continuously sending de-energized electrons over um, from PS2 to PS1. And while that is happening, you are continuously breaking down uh, the water releasing oxygen as a waste product and taking up new electrons. Like, this is not like, okay, we finished step one, we're going to move on to step two now. No, it's just like all happening at the same time. Um, we're just breaking it down into steps because it's a little bit easier to, like, understand uh, the order and the process of this. Um, but I just want to be clear that all of this happens pretty much at the same time. So... Phosphorylation, photophosphorylation is happening in two different ways uh, during this process. We have cyclic, which happens in a cycle, so this only involves PS1 and does not include the reduction of NADP+. So light is absorbed by PS1 and excited electrons enter the electron transport chain to produce ATP. After, the de-energized electron returns to PS1. So we had an electron, we use the electron, we get a new electron, <laughs> okay? So it just is a cyclic uh, process, so it's a cycle, it just goes over and over in a circle. Non-cyclic involves both PS1 and PS2 and the actual reduction of NADP+. This also needs uh, light to be absorbed, so we start with our light being absorbed um, by PS2, the excited electron enters uh, the electron transport chain, produces ATP. At the same time, photoactivation of PS1 results in the release of electrons. This is what actually reduces NADP plus to NADPH. And then 
breaking down water releases electrons to replace what we had lost by doing this process. So the non-cyclic process is like the steps one, two, and three of the previous slides. Um, the cyclic process is, it does happen, but it doesn't happen quite as frequently. And so continuing on with this, um, both ATP and NADPH are required to produce organic molecules in the next uh, process, the light independent reaction. So we like to know about this because it's important in our general understanding of how photosynthesis works. The cyclic, the cyclic photophosphorylation is important. You do need to know that. However, when we are talking about photosynthesis in the most general sense, and we're talking about the two-step process, only the non-cyclic uh, photophosphorylation allows for the entire process to happen. You need to have ATP and NADPH to actually get to the end of photosynthesis, and so only non-cyclic photophosphorylation um, can do that. Okay, so now we are moving into our next step. So we talked about step one, which was the light dependent, you needed light to do it. Now we're in light independent, um, where you don't need light to do it. So this step starts with carbon fixation. This is another three-step process. So starting with carbon fixation, it begins with a five carbon compound that is actually called ribulose biphosphate. Do you ever need to call it that? No. Um, I call it Ruby P. You can call it by its full name, but like nobody does. Um, and so it begins with Ruby P. You see that here. An enzyme called Rubisco, or if again you want the like full name, it's ribulose biphosphate carboxylase. No one calls it that. <laughs> um, so Rubisco, which is the enzyme that you do in fact need to know, catalyzes the attachment of carbon dioxide to Ruby P. So you start with Ruby P, you get carbon dioxide added to it, you end up with a six carbon compound. This six carbon compound is called glycerate three phosphate, AKA GP. So again, Everything that's in the parentheses here, Ruby P, Rubisco, GP, that's what you're gonna see on like tests. That's what you're gonna see in like um, assignments in class. Um, it's just a much more commonly used term and like much easier to go about saying. So that six carbon compound, GP, um, is really unstable. And so it will, so that six carbon compound will break into the two 3C compounds, which are GP, sorry. Um, so again, going through this quickly, it begins with a five carbon compound called Ruby P. We add CO2 to it. By doing that, we make a six carbon compound that is so unstable, it will just break into two three carbon compounds called GP. And GP is what we are going to use to start up our next step, which is the reduction of GP. GP is converted into triose phosphate, AKA TP, using NADPH and ATP. That's why we needed those two things from the light dependent reactions. So this reduction transfers hydrogen atoms to the compound while the hydrolysis of ATP provides energy. So you can see GP gets reduced into TP. We use up some ATPs and we reduce NADPH to NADP plus um, as we go through this process. Our third and final step is the regeneration of Ruby P. So we wanna get back to the beginning. You see that this is like a nice cycle, like the Krebs cycle, but this one's called the Calvin cycle. Um, so we wanna get back to the beginning so we can continue doing this. So. Our third step is the regeneration of Ruby P. Six molecules of ATP are produced per cycle, and one TP molecule may be used to form half of a sugar molecule. So 
I'm not saying this is like incredibly useful, but it happens um, in plants all the time. And so you do need to know it. So two cycles of this entire thing is required to produce a single glucose. Okay, so <laughs> the remaining five, right, because we, based on what we're starting with and what we're creating, right, three Ruby peas get broken down into six GPs, six GPs get uh, reduced into six TPs, and then um, as you're going through this, the remaining five TP molecules are recombined to regenerate Ruby P. So the regeneration obviously requires energy, and the energy is derived from the hydrolysis of ATP. So all of this is like, hey, look, I'm using up one of my TPs to make half a sugar. I'm going to do this whole process again and make the other half of the sugar, um, and I will be left with five TPs per cycle. So when I do this cycle twice, I'm left with 10 TPs, right? Because I have six to start with, two of them are going to be used to make my sugar, and I'm left with um, the 10 after, right? Three gets broken down into six, but really this is happening twice. So I have six Ruby Ps broken down into 12 GPs. GPs are reduced to 12 TPs. Two of them are used to make sugar. The remaining 10 are recycled to make our ruby peas again. Okay, Calvin cycle. I said this in the last slide and you were probably like, Cal where the heck are you getting Calvin cycle? Um, it's just another name for that reaction that we just talked about. It's named after the scientist who did this. He mapped out the complete conversion of carbon which is what we just talked about in that cycle, um, using, <clears throat> using what's known as the lollipop experiment. Now the lollipop experiment is kind of interesting, um, but then again, I think everything's interesting, so I don't know, maybe it's not. Um, he added radioactive carbon to a lollipop apparatus with green algae, induced photosynthesis by shining light, and then at different time periods, killed the algae and analyzed it using chromatography to see where the carbon compounds were, what they were, what they were doing. And he was able to actually identify the radioactive carbon using autoradiography. And by comparing all these different periods of light exposure, he was able to actually determine the order of that cycle we just talked about. So this all happened like he just did this over and over and over again until he was confident that the order of how these different like 3C, 6C, 5C carbon molecules were, bro were breaking down and building back up. Um, I did want to show you, I don't have a picture of it on this, but I did pull up a picture. So this is his setup. Um, this thing right here is the lollipop apparatus. Um, you can tell that it has a like a small looking almost pipette coming out the bottom of it for the waste products. Um, but you can tell it just sort of looks like a big lollipop. So that's why they called it that. So that's what it looks like. So continuing on, um, now we've talked about the lollipop experiment. Now. We're just gonna like briefly talk about this. We've talked about this before, so this is not like brand new information, but just so that we're clear on what um, is actually happening. This is a chloroplast. Um, it has a double membrane. The stroma is like the blue in here. It's like sort of like the, it's almost like cytoplasm. Um, but this is where the Calvin cycle happens. The thylakoids are all of, like these stacks. Um, the granum is the, um, like the stacks themselves, the thylakoids are the individual stacks, and the lamella connects and separates the stacks themselves. It's like this like roadway between um, the stacks, okay? So each individual pancake here is where photophosphorylation happens 
and then the Calvin cycle happens in uh, like the blue blue background area. Okay, so a few uh, comparison here between photosynthesis and respiration. We've talked about this a number of times throughout this lecture already, but let's just do some like really key comparisons. They both involve the production of ATP, right? One, photosynthesis uses light energy, respiration is breaking down organic molecules, and they both involve an electron transport chain and chemiosmosis. We've talked about it, we've seen it in action, um, through labs and stuff, and we, like, you, you've heard me talk about it through these notes. They are the reverse of each other. So photosynthesis is anabolic, whereas respiration is catabolic. Photosynthesis uses um, the breakdown of water to release, um, to create oxygen to release electrons for the electron transport chain. Um, electrons are taken up by NADPH, and the Calvin cycle is used to synthesize glucose, whereas respiration is sort of the opposite of that. It breaks down glucose, NADH and FADH2 release electrons for the electron transport chain, and then they're taken up by oxygen to form water. So again, in photosynthesis, you break something down. In respiration, you build something. So types of plants, there's three types of plants that you should in a very general sense know about C3 plants, C4 plants, and CAM plants. C3 plants are like what you think of when you think of plants. It's like your typical plant. Um, they fix CO2 directly from the air. Um, they just sort of go through photosynthesis very normally. So like a typical plant, like what a, a C3 plant would, would do exactly what we just talked about um, for the last like 20 minutes. <laughs> so Rubisco, though, that enzyme that we were talking about can also use oxygen as an alternative substrate if CO2 is not available. Um, this creates a different product, though, um, and that product cannot be used to make sugar, um, and so it makes the Calvin cycle less efficient. Um, it reduces the level of photosynthesis up to 25%. When you're using this to create your energy yield, um, that's a massive decrease in energy. Um, so while Rubisco can do this, uh, as you can see by this angry face, it is not ideal and we don't like it and we would rather use CO2 as our starting point. Now C4 and CAM plants, they are different plants. Um, usually found in hot and arid conditions. Um, they have evolved and adapted to limit the exposure of Rubisco to oxygen because they literally cannot, they cannot have uh, a 25% decrease in energy yield. They will die. <laughs> uh, they, they just cannot handle that. Um, and so they really try to limit that exposure. C4 and CAM plants use uh, a different enzyme called the PEP carboxylase to combine carbon dioxide to a 3C compound to make a 4C compound. Um, this um, enzyme, PEP carboxylase, has a higher affinity for CO2 than Rubisco does, and so it will not bind to O2 at all. There's no opportunity for O2 to, um, to O2, comma, to become a part of this process. Then they transfer the CO2 to regions with low oxygen concentrations to start the process. So C4 plants are like sugarcane, um, like maize, which is like a type of corn, right? So C4 pathway, um, you physically separate carbon dioxide from oxygen. CO2 is converted to a 4C compound and then separated to a deeper tissue within the plant. And then in this deeper tissue, they release CO2 and it enters the Calvin cycle. So it's just like one extra step um, to make sure that oxygen is not involved. In the CAM pathway, so CAM plants are the ones you think of when I say, hey, this is like a plant that lives in a very hot uh, area like a cactus, 
So cacti have adapted this pathway. Um, but also like pineapple, right? Pineapple are native to um, islands like Hawaii. Um, and it's very hot there. And so they also do this um, to create carbon dioxide reserves. So they're adapted to arid environments where water loss is a high, uh, it's, a, it's a problem. <laughs> uh, water loss is high because it's so hot. Um, and the stomata, the openings on the leaves, they're closed during the day. So CO2 is converted to a 4C compound during the night when stomata is open. So when it's cooler, they open up their um, gas exchange areas on the leaves, which are stoma, and CO2 is able to diffuse into the leaf. When it's daytime, they close the stomata and they use those reserves that they kind of sucked up during the night um, during the day. So it's a continuous process. It doesn't only happen during nighttime. Um, it's just that CO2 is only available to the plant at night because that's the only time the plant is open to accepting it. Um, so when the stoma are closed, oxygen can't be released either uh, because the stoma are gas exchange openings in the plant. So if CO2 is not coming in, nothing's going out either. That door is shut for the day. So all of this gas exchange that you would typically think of in plants is only happening during the night when it's cooler. So this is just like a breakdown again, right? Your typical, um, you take in CO2, you release glucose at the end. C4 plant has this extra step where you are going into a deeper tissue and then going through the Calvin cycle. And then a CAM plant is you're taking CO2 in at night and then you're using it during the day. But the process is all the same. Look, they're all still going through the Calvin cycle. It's just like the steps to get to the Calvin cycle. Okay, and finally, we made it to the end, the GAP project. The GAP project is Global Artificial Photosynthesis Project. That's what the GAP in GAP project stands for. It's the international idea to copy the natural process of photosynthesis to be more efficient, okay, to harvest solar energy technology. Um, I'm sure if you have seen literally anything, <laughs> any news in the United States um, about using solar energy or um, adopting literally anything outside of like coal energy. There is a huge, huge pushback in um, the government <laughs> and in like the Rust Belt of the US, which is like the Midwest and like up through West Virginia. Um, the idea of using natural energy has not always been fully accepted in the US. It's starting to become more of an option and this is part of that option. Um, to use and create artificial photosynthesis means that we have clean energy. Um, this would help with global warming. This would help with reducing the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, it's truly, in my opinion, the way of the future. Uh, it's just a matter of getting some people that have more say than I do on board with it. So to do this artificial photosynthesis, you harvest light energy, you transduce this energy to electrons, then use a redox reaction to generate chemical fuel sources. It's basically you are doing everything that you would typically do in photosynthesis to create energy, but you're using it to create chemical fuel sources. So it's slightly different. Um, but I don't need you to know the process of artificial photosynthesis. I need you to know um, that there is a project to develop more efficient solar energy harvesting technologies. Um, and to use this and to create this means that we are creating clean energy for the future. Okay, I know this was a lot, but I promise you um, it'll get better. And um, these were some of your longest notes that you will have throughout IB Biology. So great job. I'm super proud of you. I'll see you in class.